Welcome to Revival Cycles Tech Talk. I'm Stefan, and we are back with another installment. Today we are talking about universal starter solenoids, again, but this time we've got a new and improved kit that we have sourced from all over the world to find the best of the best and to get you exactly what you need for your project. Stick around, this one's good. All right, so we're back talking about the universal starter solenoid. But before we do that, I think there's an elephant in the room that we might need to address. You may notice that I look a little bit different and don't worry, I didn't shave my beard. Over the Christmas break, I finally had enough free time to finish the time machine that I've been working on for the last decade. And I actually went back in time before I had the beard and brought myself forward just so you could see what I look like without all of that facial hair. Now, because of the intricacies of time travel and all the rest of that, there's a pretty good chance that as the um, time continuum stitches itself back together after that rift, the beard will just come back. But it's going to take a little while, so just don't worry. We'll get back to, uh, you know, your usual, you know, ridiculous beard eventually, but it's going to take some time. Now, we're not here to talk about facial hair. We are here to talk about starter solenoids. And if you've been following us for a while, you know that we've talked about this in the past, and you maybe even already know why you need one. You can see that link below. You can go back and watch the old one. Uh, we're going to cover some of the same stuff, but mostly I want to cover what is different about this new kit and why do we bother to put this all together. And rather than opening up this one that's packaged and ready to go out to you, I'm going to open this one that we haven't finished yet. You get some instructions. We'll cover those later. You get some fuses just for your convenience. These are the same as what you can find at the auto parts store, but we just wanted to save you some trouble. And you also get a little baggie full of connectors and connector parts. And then here's the meat of the whole equation, and that's the starter solenoid. And then a couple of mounting brackets. This new solenoid is slightly smaller um, in form factor, so it's a little bit easier to package. And it has a nice cap that covers up your main fuses, helps to keep moisture and debris out of there. So. This was just a nice, simple package that we felt was a little bit of an upgrade, a little bit of a modernization to the old one. And the big driver for that is this connector is a lot better than the old one. The amount of force required to seat it is less. The amount of force required to remove it is less and it's waterproof. Worth it. But you still get the same handy dandy little mounting tabs that you can either weld or bolt on and they just still slip into this rubber housing. That simple. So you can bolt that down and you've got good vibration isolation, a waterproof connector, and it's worth mentioning, you can search around the internet. You're not going to find this kit assembled with the correct connector, the correct solenoid, the correct mounting, with fuses, anything else. We've had to kind of aggregate, put this all together from a number of different suppliers and actually assemble these kits in house. The real driver for the new kit was the waterproof connector and the slightly smaller form factor and we thought it's about time let's just give you guys the fuses you need and that way you can select from the range and you don't have to chase around town to find this trivial part that just comes with this kit all right so we haven't really talked about the instructions yet but that's another big reason why you might want to buy this kit so these are the instructions and we've spent a, f a lot of time putting this together. We've tried to make it really clear. We've tried to make it self-explanatory, something that even if you don't have a lot of experience, you can still get a good understanding of how the system works, how you're supposed to connect it. Uh, we've demonstrated how it integrates with an M unit, and we've also given a layout of how the uh, solenoid part works, how the main fuse part works, and where those terminals are located on the device. A little bit of just a rough guide for what you need to do. This is something that you don't usually find in most kits. Most kits have crappy Xerox instructions that are cryptic and incomplete, and they make sense if you know what you're doing, but they're not designed for someone who's still trying to learn the ropes. You can check this out on revivalcycles.com, or of course, this comes in the kit. All right. Whiteboard time. What we're here to do is talk about what's going on inside of this and to try and break it down into more of a schematic or theoretical level. I've saved you guys a little bit of pain and torture by trying to sketch a little bit of this out beforehand. Over here, this is the actual solenoid. So if we look at, at this guy, we see these two big terminals here. Well, that's terminal one and two. Those are kind of the, the big contacts with the threads and the extra stuff. And then next up, we've got the ones in the middle. That's three and four. So three and four right here. Those are the control coils. So that's what wraps around. It's kind of down inside of this thing and it kind of wraps around somewhere in there. Don't worry about that detail. Just remember the middle ones, that's three and four control coil. 
and then you can kind of trace um, the five and six terminal right from terminal number one through the main fuse, which is the squiggly bit. That's how you represent that in the electrical schematic. That goes to terminals five and six that are out here. Um, so those are these on the outside. What do you do now? How do you hook this thing up? Well, uh, the first thing is really easy. We can just throw in a couple of grounds. So we can throw in a ground from the battery and we can throw in a ground from the control coil. Uh, I should explain that the first round of this, we're gonna talk about how you integrate with an M unit. Obviously this box with plus and minus is a battery. So we are short one thing and that's a starter. Let's say that this starter looks as terrible as all my starters look. And that's right here, that kind of thing. And that needs to connect to terminal number two. And this is that big screw terminal that's on the side of your starter. Most of the time, starters have an, uh, just an internal ground and by virtue of them being bolted to the engine, that means that they are grounded. We're now connected to terminal two to the starter. We've got terminal one is connected internally to the solenoid through the main fuse to terminal five and six, but terminal one is not connected to the battery. So let's do that. Terminal one connects to the battery. All right, so now if we follow this, we've got power going from the battery to terminal one, through terminal one, through the main fuse to terminal five and six. So now anything connected to terminal five and six is directly connected back to the battery. Super handy. So if, if anything gets crazy on, on what's connected to terminal five and six, main fuse blows, everything's cool. So what about actually getting your starter to work? This kind of covers the thing we missed the last time, and that is what the main fuse is doing. So what's the starter solenoid itself, the real meat and potatoes of what this thing does? What's it, it doing? The starter solenoid would be connected to the start output of the M unit, and the start output of the M unit blue actually has two connections, so we'll represent those like that. The original V2 M unit only has one, so that's just one wire going in there. And either way, it's not important. None of that detail matters. Just note the M unit blue has two, the M unit V2 only has one. Now, when the start output turns on, that sends power through this whole control coil back to ground through terminal four. And when that happens, it creates a magnetic field. That magnetic field creates a force and that moves this contact plate into contact with the two connections between terminal one and terminal two. That sends power to the starter, starter spins, bike starts, everything's great. Now, when you let off the starter button, the M unit takes away power to the control coil and that contact plate returns to its original position where it is not contacting terminal one and two. Starter doesn't have power, nothing happens, everybody's happy, you ride away and enjoy your ride. So what about the case where you don't have an M unit? This is a little bit interesting and there's two different ways you can handle it. We're gonna back up and get rid of that ground because there's two different ways that you can handle a non M unit install of a starter solenoid. You can either directly connect to the main power. So now this, this control coil has connection to positive but there's no connection to ground, therefore nothing happens. And you would add a switched ground connection. So when you close this switch, now you've got current flowing. This contact plate moves. Sorry, I'm not gonna draw it because it's a hassle. But suffice to say, you can imagine if you've got a ground switch, that controls the power through the control coil, controls the movement of the contact plate, and controls when the starter turns on. Alternatively, you could also put your switch on the positive side. And this is effectively the same, the exact same thing. So you could have your switch on the positive side. And now when you close the positive side switch, power flows through the control coil, contact plate moves, power goes to the starter. Hopefully you found this helpful and this does at least include the function of the main fuse included with this specific starter solenoid. We're gonna go back to the real world and we can just erase this whole whiteboard mess 
and you can resume your regularly scheduled physical world programming. Right, so these waterproof connectors are super cool, but if you haven't assembled one before, it might be a little bit confusing, and I just wanna quickly cover how, how this one works. So the first thing let's talk about is this um, yellow part here. Like you can see there's this weird yellow shape, and that's actually the Terminal Position Assurance Device, uh, sometimes abbreviated a TPA. And in order to assemble this, we need to get that out of the way. So you can just kind of flat blade screwdriver, pocket knife, whatever, get that out of the way. And now the little latch pins can move in order to accept the terminals. We're gonna need a little bit of wire in order to actually put this together. So, wow, check that out, convenient. Um, this is a 12 gauge TXL wire. This is the same as what we include for the main fuses uh, in our wire kit. And I'm just gonna strip back about mm, a little more than an eighth inch. Let's see, that's probably about two millimeters, somewhere right around in there. And I just wanna kinda get rid of that part. What is determining that length is really the terminal. So what I want is I want just enough wire sticking through this front part of the crimp terminal that I get a good crimp, but I don't want a ton sticking through and I don't want it to be short of that terminal. So that's pretty close to correct. Now I'm gonna add the cable seal. The orientation of the cable seal is important because you want the ribbed part to be to the outside. That's gonna actually seal up on the housing and you want the small narrow kind of barrel part to be on the insulation of the wire and that's gonna get caught by the, the back part of the crimp. So we can slip that on. Now I'm using a 12 gauge wire and that arguably is a little bit large for this connector but it does work. So now we can put that into the terminal and now we grab our favorite double barrel U crimp crimping tool and for whatever reason I like to crimp the actual contacts first and then follow up with the cable seal part and there we can see that's a complete crimp. Now I noticed that it it bent a little bit during the crimping so I'm going to just straighten that out by holding the cable seal and bending that back up. Now I can see that's pretty close to straight and it should go into the housing without any trouble. Orientation going into the housing is not too difficult. You'll notice that there's some tabs on the bottom and a little bit of a window and that's what's going to accept the notch inside of the housing and because of these tabs you really can't assemble this wrong so if you try to put it in one way and it doesn't want to go that means that you're putting it in the wrong way. So let's try to do this the wrong way first. See, it doesn't matter. I could probably really force that in, but it, it, it's not happy, I can tell. So if you notice the release tab is on the top, the locating tabs are on the top, the window for the latch is on the top, and now everything just clicks into place. And you can notice on the front, you see that that terminal is into position. And now we would add the terminal position assurance device. And that clips into place. And what that does is it holds the retaining tab down so that the terminal can't slip back out. The only way that that terminal is coming out of this housing is if it pulls the, uh, the crimp out. But since we crimp this with a double U crimp, I don't think there's an issue. And that is how you do these terminals. And again, the reason that we put this kit together is because we couldn't find it from somebody else. This isn't really available anywhere else. So why not buy it from us? The more that we're able to, the more that we will build kits that make it easier for you to build bikes. And really, at the end of the day, all we want is we want to get your project back on the road. So with that, thanks for watching.